Hello everyone, today we talk about migration and Viking eras uh, swords, Germanic swords mostly, and the importance that they uh, acquired in, in, uh, in these societies that produced them gradually, right, we could date to, you know, here the migration era starts in some, you know, is lost in some mist, right, you know, it's always an approximation, and most of the blades that we we can study and their their hills, you know, the, the, the swords entire that were conceived important, have to be conceived importantly as, as objects, right, not just as weapons, right, and um, they are overlapping, but conceptually is important to distinguish are from a later date than the migration year and mostly you know what occurred in in the let's say from from Roman to more or less Carolingian times you know that there was a you know uh, uh, most, mostly a Celtic metallurgic tradition that was quite advanced where other countries in Europe and elsewhere that that were famous for their uh, for their blades for their for their weapons uh, think about the Saint Celtiberian tradition from which the the Romans drew, and also which is al was also a, essentially an extension of the Latin one in many ways. Uh, the gladius uh, is not just this, you know the, the short dagger of the of the you know so functionalized as such for early imperial times, but you think stereotypically is all it the only thing a legionnaire would use uh, to get it. By the way, still with other weapons. But, you know, the early examples are fundamentally, importantly, long swords, also with uh, a dramatic cutting capacity, which is, I don't know why, it's such a simple thing to see, even just archaeologically, people have to see it's just about trusting, no, not really, right, they stem from that direction, and this is not the point, but fundamentally the Romans uh, uh, acquired a great part of such um, of such metallurgic traditions, especially from, from Central Europe, where the uh, the the greatest advancement had occurred already because of a um, of a, an aristocratic culture that had uh, emphasized the role of, of of the champion, right, of the warrior. Celtic societies had been advancing towards something more developed from from a military point of view. The the true heroic tradition at the time of the you know b before Roman conquest occurred existed truly just in Britain, right, where uh, there was actually the lowest of the military quality in the Celtic lands, but we're still, and this idea of uh, the centrality of the warrior overloaded in in hardware that could improve his dramatic psychophysical skills against the enemy, um, was something that would reinforce towards the early Middle Ages, right after that the, the Roman world um, that had again integrated the systems. Think about the the Calbus Noricum that was extracted from the same places we, in Austria today, where you know there is fine um, steel um, for for the industry that is extracted and so on, because this was a more carbonized uh, iron naturally in those mountains, um, and that's in fact the Noricum, the area where the uh, at least one of the most important metallurgic uh, skills had. Developed and the Romans uh, kind of maintained a bit as the center of such production. Eventually shifted towards the uh, the Upper Rhineland during the Migration Year, and that's in fact where most of the so an area would be monopolized by by the Franks, right? Uh, this area between the uh, Francia and Alamannia, fundamentally, and that is the one from which throughout the or the early Middle Ages, the best swords would have been produced and also exported, right? Uh, the Viking era swords are fundamentally a you know a derivation of, of of that, if not properly the direct product from from the Rhineland, and uh, the reason being that um, Frankish society from Merovingian to to Carolingian times had gone developing further swords for the uh, the the gradual um, oligarchization of their of their of their communities, right, and therefore the the rise in importance, as we will see, of the warrior, of the mounted professional warrior, that was transforming, in fact, into something else, and what we will see as the knight later on, and that, um, uh, of course, used you know a complex panoply, but in which this sword maintained uh, a crucial uh, and would maintain throughout all the, the Middle Ages it, it, its own crucial significance, not again just as 
a hardware, but properly as the reflection, per se, of a political, military, and social superiority that was all packed with this dramatic um, moral ideals, right, of, of, of uh, individual honor, strength, capacity, you know, and, and fitness to command, right, in societies where the, the majority of the people was growing essentially like subordinated, right, as peasants working for these guys. In fact, this uh, very narrow elite, however ultra-loaded, in 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 uh, in capacities in moral and in physical strength of which they had to train literally a lifetime in which this world uh, embodied let's say the most the deadliest element of all and the and therefore the the purity right the strength right the, these are things that the swords by themselves presented as we will see now and the wealth the rich these were objects in the forms that of literally of jewels right the the cost of them was extraordinary and the role of this word um, was naturally um, essentially uh, being an anti uh, like it, as, as it was the alter ego of the same warrior it had to be also the one that could take the other warriors out right and so it, it's often underestimated how the developments in sword making independently from modern testing that is surely important and, and shows more or less what it was also at the time but made of the sword essentially the only weapon or at least one of the, the most standard weapon essentially to cope of course with any kind of situation in a way but also to m make significant damage against armored opponents right uh, there are certain literary uh, literary and we think of cut mostly cutting through you know uh, mostly an armor individual and this was surely the truth right it's, it's part of the reason why also certain weapons developed further in certain contexts where you know chopping was was easy right but the idea is that this sword is also an anti-armor weapon independently from um, the, the the fact that of course it's very difficult to actually cut through armor if not uh, not exactly what you're even searching to do in the first place, but aside from the blow that could arrive, you know, from could be transmitted underneath, that is actually what the trauma brings on, on the human body. But also the 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 dramatic um, qualities of these blades and the ways that especially these people were trained to do, well, about which we don't know much, right? We don't know perfectly how these things were done, um, nor we can replicate them today perfectly, right? Nor we have especially the context in which they were used and how they were used, right? It's useless to say, okay, you know, we, know we have a sword, we make reenactment, we understand how they use them. Nobody knows, right? There, there were, uh, it's not even just about the fact that there were fence entries as, at the time, you have to wait for the later Middle Ages, but it, it's properly about the fact that we, we, we know too few about that world to even and especially about the moral dimension of these warriors that that make even the employment of this word something that not we cannot under, you know visualize in a rationalizing sense but we cannot measure from a moral and, and technical and, and 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 even physical point of view right and this words had definitely the capacity also to damaging armor sensitive especially after several blows uh, and this was also part of the, the deal in a in, in general, not quite the first aim, but still something that was meant that the sword had to fundamentally to 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 achieve, right? Again, there's a lot of people were going to be against this idea because they said oh, you have don't know anything about the fact that they, you know, uh, we have tested this thing that they don't cut. Right? It, it's not important. The the important thing is that we know that until the spread of plate armor, they still can sensibly suffer from from a cut. The, however, the, the, uh, these, words were the, these words had been developed throughout all medieval times for cutting capacity and that w if that direction fundamentally stops with more tapering forms and more kind of, you know, getting to the, in fact, designed to get into the, into the, um, into the exposed areas between the plates, but also, you know, increasing in size, think about the double hand sword and also the power, and so something that had to shatter the wall structure that kept the, the, the plates together. Um, we cannot but realize that until plate armor came by, uh, swords were designed were increasingly designed to be ever more cutting, right? So, um, since that stops exactly in the moment in which plate arrives, well, our understanding is that even the damage, the 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 way these blades could could damage mail was was sensible enough to dictate that kind of development, 
right? Because the battlefields didn't essentially change even in the presence of lighter troopers um, or other, you know, contact. Like after all, the sword um, is definitely the, the most complicated thing to to create, the most expensive, etc. There is all a its physics is very complex. Um, we will make vi more videos about swords, but um, the the idea is that it's still, after all, a simple tool, right? You know, you 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 have to you, you can do certain things with it that are mostly connected the way you use the tool, not much because of the the tooling itself that can have certain characteristics that allow you to do certain things. In fact, but it's essentially that you know, cutting and trusting, and um, of course, also the, the the various fencing. I mean, the same pairing, the same. I mean, all the what what the, the sword you can do with a sword, but as as you can do in theory, even just with with another weapon, that in in it in the essence, right? So hence the the concepts of simplicity. Albeit it, it wasn't a simple thing at all, right? But what um, we talk about today is essentially the pattern welding uh, welding method that. Is, is essentially mixing these different, uh, mm, let's say, ingots, cuts of, you know, of, of, of uh, carbonized uh, iron at different degrees of carbonization to, to achieve certain, um, to, to mm, because different parts of the blade were also put under different strains. And so uh, this thing, this technique costed a lot, right? And eventually metallurgy developed and we arrived to mostly what we call the, the damask that, that is, you know, a, a much more properly, uh, homo homogeneously, right, essentially homogeneously carbonized um, uh, mm, uh, iron blade, right, that, uh, in fact, starts occurring more or less from the production of the sources since the, the night, from the ninth century onwards, and it's the, 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 the villain type of war that, as we will see, uh, also in the cost naturally increased dramatically then in the later middle ages also with the hydraulic um, uh, let's say furnaces and so on um, would uh, increase dramatically the quality of this blade and so on other countries did it in different ways in India you know the, the wood steel all these things were because they had literally monsoons that insufflated regularly and in the same especially that's the most important thing at the same with the same um, flux, right? A stable flux of of of, um, of air in this um, in the furnaces, and that could arrive to you know to to much higher uh, temperatures, right? For for working these swords better. Um, so it was a very gradual process, and with knowledge and capacities very very empiric, as we know, and as we will see better today. But that are uh, you know we can find alongside this constant path of civilization in the uh, in the sword as, as a tool that remained all along and that uh, always maintained its own um, its own superiority its own magic values I its own arcane power right that went beyond even the same physicality that were that was all you know even in, in its own spiritual dimension was all in, with the same as it was with the warrior so this is very very deep in the way, of course, that the warrior would also relate to the same sword. And we will talk more about this. And today we, d we see about these techniques, production techniques, and also the costs, naturally, of these of these swords. It could be really, really considerable. So we were saying before, we m base ourselves for studying these swords mostly in several hundred Merovingian specimens of Frankish and Alemannic manufacture, from the 5th to the 7th century have been discovered in various countries. And so we have seen this in ingenious method. Um, there's a, there were bar-shaped uh, bar iron ingots, some of which were, um, yes, they, they were carburized in, in a different, different degree. Um, in, in this way, blades of pure iron and carburized iron were produced. Mm -hmm which were then worked alternately by overlaying them. And the bar thus obtained was twisted into a spiral, flattened, and worked on the anvil. Right? Uh, and with two or four bars threaded in this way, the cord of blade was thus obtained, its section being 
essentially stratified iron and mild steel at the same time. And it's obvious that we, we talk about steel. Now, if you look at in engineering standards today, uh, such the, the levels of carbonization at a time and, you know, do not make these, um, uh, you know, the, 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 this thing fitting even in the concept of steel anymore, right, by our modern parameters. But they still were from a strictly chemical point of view, right? Um, it, it was um, simply iron hardened by an oxidation process. And it is important, as, as we were saying before, that this also depended on the part of the, of the blade because, for example, the tip that was known in Latin as uh, atius, right, you know, shows us today that, you know, this, that rather than forging entire weapons, it was important to make the parts of, of the blade most exposed to the struggle uh, in need of hardness, right? So uh, this was a thing since a long time uh, before. And um, so the the cuts, right? The, these um, these various um, ingots that were um, in more carburized metal were welded to its core. Right, it could contain from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 of carbon. And the longitudinal weld was shaped thus with interlocks, you know, in order to increase the solidarity between the core and the cuts. Then everything was passed to the grinding wheel and cleaned. Right? And the result was a finished blade, the average uh, you know thickness of which was roughly five millimeters the length was something between 75 to 95 centimeters and the width 3.5 to 6 right on average and on average as well the the, the weight of, of this blade was around seven on uh, 700 grams now towards the Carolingian age the tendency was to make these blades heavier by essentially lengthening and widening them, broadening them. And of course this corresponds uh, to the parallel weighting of the defense web, right, and the handling of the horse from the sword, but making it making the weapon more effective it was longer. Right? So always bear this in mind, it was very overlooked. Um, in the context of why swords had were present in the first place, that they did, they did, um, you know, the, the, there is this bias I get sometimes that they, they as if the, the word was not, um, uh, let's say, was uh, not affected particularly from the wagoning of of armor, for example, as if you know, a sword would preferably just you know, cut things soft targets and and that's it because otherwise you know the, the blade will not be that was not the point right B blades were definitely conceived to crush against armor right it was even as we've said before even if they wouldn't cut normally through it or wouldn't break the you know but but just a few rings if you you know because these guys were skilled naturally to to make it in combat is very difficult it's very wild right but the ideal is of course to 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 strike uh, with a the right angle with the uh, on, on the right very center of the sword by delivering this un unspeakable force in, in just a, a single gentleman that would have to to, to be dis destroyed in, in that process and this again this this words optimally were were kind of designed for right at least to coping with them not cutting through through armor like butter as certain sources will read now actually say but still, also consider the quality of the armor sometimes, and don't underestimate that either. But of course, you know, yeah, it was plenty of softer targets for, for that thing to be affected that way as well. Um, but always consider this: that yes, there is a direct correspondence always in the evolution of swords between sword and armor. I mean, heavy armor. I mean, the the top uh, the top armor, right? So everything metal concerned was designed to. To cope with other metal, con you know, concern thing. Um, so look at the heaviest armor that existed. Look at the heaviest weapons that existed. And so 
you know that they were directly influencing each other, right? And that probably deleting um, patterns of evolution of these uh, of, of both were measured chiefly for one another, not much. Uh, you know, some kind of abstract saying, okay, yes, we will improve just this world because of, you know, metallurgic improvements just to cut better through, you know, softly armored or unarmored opponents, right? That would have been, in a sense, useless, right? At least for properly the, char the, the physical characteristics this world had, and this can be easily seen or how swords evolved eventually when armor was not, when it was not around anymore, and firearms, and so... Yes, these words were something very sturdy and, you know, e evidently capable of delivering massive blows that had to do with armor opponents in the process as well. So, the metal obtained with these systems we, we exposed exhibits a fairly homogeneous structure, right? Uh, with tight grains upon metallographic examination with the maximum hardness and the maximum tenacity compatible um, at the time. The weak point of all this processing remained essentially the temper because the uh, the quenching operations described with so much wonder in Germanic poetry for example remain superficial to the point that according to modern scholars um, these blades were, were not even properly hardened right in the sense that the martensite was not present in the steel um, thus obtained. In any case, the resistance tests carried out on blades of, of, of you know, pattern welded uh, type and on the other coeval uh, ones consisting of a forged iron bar, right, have shown that the former are much less fragile than the latter, right, and at the same time not very deformable either, which remember the thing about about of course uh, armor uh, there is there a pattern they, they wanted them to here not to I mean you, you would imagine that the, the, the best way to, 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 to damage them sensibly to deform them was of course against heavy targets right hard targets as well so uh, as we have seen not very tampered but still in in the practice what this would 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 make them different from a simple you know a single just uh, forged iron bar would have been to maintain uh, you know the, to, to absorb these blows and remaining still kind of usable over time and of course they, they would they would give plenty of such blows in the process so beyond the intrinsic qualities of these weapons the value that had to preside over their great prestige was beauty Right, you may say oh, it's just aesthetics, and again, no, because these beauty had it had to do also with psychological issues. You would you would imagine that such you know a sword doesn't is not able to intimidate you. Well, it's completely the other way around. Um, the uh, the the um, the blade were created were iridescent, right, almost silk uh, looking on the surface, right. It was were much appreciated as such because they were the types of blades that had the, the aforementioned qualities and that were visibly so so by just looking at a blade like that you would say that thing damn works against me and it works better than other type of weapons and when you're definitely risking your life in the process um, and you you have been bitten by these swords and you know what those blows are you know are fundamentally on you you're going to be intimidated by that. You're going, of course, to be intimidated also by the warrior, but also the the uh, properly by the, the the prestige of the owner and how expensive that was in the way you could recognize. Right. Aside from decorations, for example, there is a great uh, there is a great um, passage from uh, the admired letter from Cassiodorus to the Vandal Trasimund. So, in a context here of an exchange between essentially Ostrogothic Italy and Vandal Africa. And Cassiodorus, talking to the Vandal, says, "You're f uh, so speaking f on behalf of the of the of the Ostrogothic king." Theodoric says, "Your fraternity has sent us long swords capable of cutting even armor. Swords more precious for how their iron was worked than for their value in gold." <laughs> 
uh, and more of that later. They shine with such polite clarity that they clearly reflect the face of the beholder. Their perfectly sharp cuts are so straight and regular that they would be thought to be cast rather than grindstone. Their souls, tra uh, traversed by an elegant groove, are furrowed with fine lines in, in which a so soft iridescence sense plays that one would think they are made of shining metal. Um, uh, we could translate pattern welded by substances of various colors. This metal has been so carefully polished by your whetstone and so carefully polished by your sand that the shiny iron has become a mirror for men. Nature has favored your homeland with gifts such as to ensure you exceptional fame. Swords so beautiful that they would be said to be the work of Vulcan who worked the iron with such skill that the work that came out of his hands passed for being produced not by men but by gods. This is Cassiodorus Varie 5.1 uh, if you are interested. Uh, so this is uh, uh, of course an impressive set of qualities we've seen this also almost aesthetical appreciation that however was mirrored by also their dramatic physical capacities. Right, the first thing it says uh, that this this long swords ca were capable. Of, uh, I mean, long swords not technically meant. I mean, did this words as they were definitely long and the, the already in the sixth century, the time of Cassiodorus, mounted warfare among these peoples was, was a big deal. Right, so especially among peoples like the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, where kind of Eastern Germanic had received more of that kind of Sarmatian Iranian bias. Right, that for this were you know, from the steps, you know, that the me me metallurgy was quite advanced and they had kind of topped these things and all, even Celtic tradition, even the, the developing, you came essentially from there together with all the mystics of this world and their military religions and so on. Um, what does it says? It says that these words are capable of cutting even armor, right? So I wouldn't say again that I know that there is legitimately from chemists, rain actors, people who have tried to replicate these things that say no, it, it doesn't cut armor, it's, it's kind of uh, a license, it's not true. Well, I, I give you this, that observe by, uh, you know, in, in historically how this idea was, uh, this were not falchions, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, you know, some other late medieval representation, of course, some are fictional, some is, uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense. But again, think that even if maybe Cassiodorus was exaggerating, the first thing that he would expose in this international scenario, in this piece of uh, rhetoric, etc., is the fact that these wars were capable of cutting even armor. So this is, is, is in order of importance, more important, of course, that, that came first than the things he said later, that they were very precious, they were extremely expensive, Right, so w which is the thing that you would say had a big deal of importance that they shined, that they ref they, they were like uh, mirrors, um, um, for, and that they 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 could even cut so straightly and regularly, right? And so it was like all these things. Um, the first thing he says that they could cut even through armor, which again would would have seemed naturally by such statement an extraordinary thing even for the time. So it's not, ah, uh, yeah, by default, these words cut armor, we all know, wink, wink. No, it's saying, you know, these words are a big deal because they are capable of cutting even armor, which is, of course, not a normal thing for them to do. And, of course, we would have liked to see what Cassidars factually meant about this. How much could they cut through armor, realistically? But it's still important that a, a historical datum, together with others, we have it, right? So... The let's say pattern welding was, moreover, only one of the te techniques for making portentous swords. Right, Th there was also a further evolution. There is a beautiful, you know, in the Germanic folklore, there is the the figure of the blacksmith Wieland, right, and um, there is, from the Thidrex Saga we get such a, a, a beautiful description of very complex and more complex 
procedures than uh, pattern welding, which corresponds to a phase in which this the, the same procedure was somewhat now uh, up outdated, right? More of the Didrek saga later because it comes from a later time from from this one, but it's still worth reading the uh, what what they thought. In fact, at the time of Akon the Fort of Norway in the 13th century, where naturally things had gone past beyond. But this is the the thing. Viel, uh, quote Vieland then went to the forge set to work and in seven days forged a sword because here the king had asked him to do it for him and, and it says on the seventh day the king himself came to him the sword was already finished and Nidung, which, which is the king had never seen any more beautiful or sharper they went to a river Veland took a foot thick staple of wool and threw it into the water in the direction of the current um, he then put the sword in the water, the thread against the current, so that the, um, the, the bow was pushed onto the thread and cut in half. Right, so this is the idea of how sharp the, the cut was. And the king said, it is a good sword, and wanted it for himself. But Wieland replied, it is not particularly good, it can get better. I will not settle for it sooner. The king then returned happy to his home. Wieland returned to the forge, selected a file and reduced the sword to fine filings which he then mixed with floor. He then made some tame birds fast for three days and gave them, to a, uh, to gave them that concoction to eat. He then put the bird drops in, in, in the oven, brought to fusion in order to purify the iron of any slag and with the metal thus obtained, he forged a new sword. This was smaller than the previous one. At the end of the work, here is the king again. A as he saw the sword, he wanted it for him, saying, I have never seen such a jewel. Bieland retorted, Sir, this sword is good, but I it can still be improved. They went back to the river. This time Bieland threw a two-foot thick staple wool into the stream, which was cut like the first. The king then proclaimed that nowhere could a better sword be found, but Wieland replied that it could uh, still be improved. This made the king happy, who joyfully returned to his home. Wieland went back to the forge, filed the table again, the, the, excuse me, the blade again, and worked as before. After three weeks, he had manufactured a glittering weapon, encrusted with gold and equipped with a precious handle. It was held very well in hand. The first swords that Wieland had made were larger than usual. The king returned to Wieland, admired the weapon and claimed it was the best and strongest he had ever seen. They returned to the river. Wieland took a three foot thick equal length staple of wool and threw it into the current. He quietly held the sword in the water, the bow was brought to the edge of the weapon and cut with the same ease with which the water itself was um, was cut. He then exclaimed, Nidung, you will have a good search all over the world, you will not find a sword that is like this. Wieland replied, sir, I will not allow the sword to belong to anybody but you, but before I give it to you, I want to make it a, a sheet and belt. Right? So it's a hell of a, a passage. So the, the, the Tidrex saga protagonist of which is Theodoric is actually um, a very late product right uh, matured as we were saying before at the court of Akon the fort of Norway in the 13th century and influenced naturally by the the, 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 the king's desire to transplant Cortus ideals there in a time which you know um, the the Germanic poetry and you know, all the chivalry uh, romances that were, were booming where, where it was a way to to boost feudalism further in the Scandinavian kingdoms at that point for strengthening royal royal power but let's say undoubtedly a lot of the material that constitutes the saga is ancient as we were saying before the the, the Vieland legion is very very old right um, you find it in the migration era still uh, you know, these figures of Vieland, uh, the Smith, and so on. Uh, 
and it, it is symptomatic um, given that we were reading before the precious Latin passage of Cassiodorus and that the fact that the saga refers to Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, back in the day, in the 6th century, well that the the most important aspect is 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 in this legend the the interest in high quality blame right and so um the definitely the alemannic uh swords that we know from from that time for archaeologically documented etc definitely correspond in a sense to this kind of working and the fact that of course you know centuries has passed by but the the we see the the necessity of improving that quality that was uh, all around the, the competition about this wars right always remember that for such masterpieces there were like other nine uh so so swords in the first place and that not all the stuff came out in the same way but yeah i mean we're talking still about very similar pieces of hardware right and so this reflects naturally the fact that 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 for the the thousands of warriors the uh, tens of thousands of warriors that that could afford such a weapon all over europe not just in germanic countries but also in the slavic i mean you know broadly meant right all over the uh, europe the mediterranean well there was a pretty homogeneous um well distinctions possible of course um production of such swords after all th this is what we tend to forget about those times is that technology was uh, dramatically homogeneous material culture was dramatically homogeneous so uh, it's not, of course there were different qualities of, of blades uh, but the the ways the top was done was kind of shared right there, there was a lot of course of of um, craft secrets among the smiths, there, w there was all, also a, all a prejudice, all a uh, you know smiths had a particular role in folklore. They were connected also to the the tonic dimension. They were thought to have this kind of uh, specific character it was also somewhat tricky in nature because of of the the magic that stood within these words. It was seen as uh, as something risky, as something dangerous, that also the bravest could could handle, right? And so this naturally reflected the fact that, that the best blades could be afforded just by the best trained warriors that were the richest people. All the anthropology you can see behind these things, but let's say, yes, it was a pretty standard thing. Here we're talking about the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, uh, the Alamanni, later on the, the sagas that circulated everywhere in you know in, in europe and so on so um of course unfortunately were not documented enough um lots of oral tradition there that was lost we read the sagas we we see just a part of that uh, in a mediated fashion but still the substance is coherent with what we know archaeologically speaking and the technique used by Wieland that is extremely refined requires as we have seen already by the text, a very long time to manufacture a single sword. This costed really a lot, right? Even, even if, you know, this was destined for a sovereign, where right? you you couldn't but wait for months, sometimes, right? And the the difficulties of forging a long blade uh, in the passage we've just read, right? That this blade was larger than usual are quite well indicated by the fact that the more perfect the metal, the smaller the size of the weapon. So it was a big deal to increase the size of the weapon in that regard. And think about it, because, of course, weapons are uh, anatomic, ergonomic. They are modeled on the, on the, uh, on the, their sizes, like any other weapon is modeled on the size of, of, of the, the wielder, right? And, but still the weapon in itself has a specific function that also adapts, let's say, tactically to the need. So, um, the larger the sword, naturally, the greater the training, the, the, the physical uh, prowess, the, the fact of needing to use it, but, you know, but the, 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 la the longer the, the length of the training and the amount of resources you have invest in it, right? So, these things were influenced by political and social factors that, in fact, went in parallel with the same technological developments as gradual as they were. And then there were all these tricks that, again, very empirical, but still scientific. Um, 
For example, a steel cementing agent enters the processing, that is, bird excrement, uh, rich in carbon and ammonia, and easy to find, by the way. Um, you've seen Veland that makes the, the birds fasting. The, these domestic birds um, that were served at an ingestible meal were probably G's, right? Uh, whose feces contain a good amount of carbon and ammonia. And the goose in itself, we've seen it also in, in other videos, was considered to have had to, to have very specific knowledge and wisdom and and hidden one because why? Because it migrated. It went into the skies and went away, right? Earning in that sense kind of divine knowledge that would be present in itself. The goose it's present, you know, think about uh, the Romans with uh, the capital, the sacred Junus uh, G's that uh, make the the goals, you know, the, the alarm of the goals attack, and you know, even participate into the combat, like the even the Celtic world is a very, itself it's a very strong presence. You know, the the, the goes has this arcane knowledge and magic that's associated with um, with the sacred, and by adding this good amount of carbon and ammonia, the, the metal obtained is homogeneous and excellently forgeable. Um, and this is also beyond pattern welding, as we were saying before. Um, consider that the Arab travelers of the 9th century noticed the mastery of Germanic blacksmiths and the use of such techniques as well. In, in the 10th, 11th century, for example, Al-Biruni and Al-Kindi took up the subject with allusions also to iron-eating birds, which also find parallels in India and in China. And as for the shape of the long sword, also for the Western metallurgical technique, the problem of oriental origins arises, like that, but the specialists haven't still addressed the, the thing either. Because, of course, as we were saying before, since millennia, this, this knowledge had mostly been derived from, from cultures that had mastered me metallurgical skills from a very early age, especially especially in the steppes, right? And again, they're not because, as you know, the steppes were particularly more, you know, because <laughs> particularly advanced places, but because their kind of feudal, you know, dimension, if you can call it this way, had, had brought to the development of the heavily armored cavalry that required also a sword to, to fight. Uh, think about all the Sarmatians, the Excalibur thing that, that in Britain those Roman auxiliaries brought and re was reinforced throughout all the migration here in Europe and that um, so the sword as an alter ego of the warrior that is something, an alter ego at the end of the day of the same divine power, right, with metal and the, the, the so the actonic capacity but at the same type, at the same level, a, a spiritual one, right, of um, you know, the, that's symbolized by also by the horse that it can be both things actually makes the the warrior flying eventually to the skies in glory right um for his uh, virtue and also for the ultimate end in destiny um and yeah the findings of the excavations carried out above all in the pit box of uh Jutland peninsula and the Rhine basin demonstrate together with the reliable testimonies of Arab authors by the way how little imagination the Nordic poets employed in describing met metallurgical operations because swords of this type must have been worth indeed a fortune and indeed the best weapons are found only in the graves of high-ranking people and consider how different this model was from the allegedly democratic, not that this is kind of a negative thing, the character of Ro Roman weapons. The Romans had had the same thing. They came from an archaic feudal reality where the warrior was overloaded in the same way. And eventually they became a civilization. They they, they enlarged dramatically by scale their own uh, status, you know, their armor production. They, they increased dramatically the value of you know, collective training, combined arms, so they, they were just superior from a military point of view at the point that they didn't need to overload every trooper to, to make it a warrior. They were now a state, so for the legionnaires, they, they produced 
very fine equipment before we were talking about the Calbus Norcum for, for the Gladius, but producing serious and generally without precious ornaments, right? There was no need to overload these words and, you know, who knows which means. Th th there is something of this, like in general, in all weapons, in all armor, you do see a care and a uh, kind of, um, you know, of, co of course, even of customization that don't think wasn't intertwined even at a provincial level with such other traditions and cultures because at the end of the day, most of the world was kind of mm, uh, aristocratic in nature, right? And the same Roman one, but still for, for the legionnaire, especially in the early empire, this wasn't quite the, the, the case, right? We see, uh, in fact, the Sparta taking over even among the, the heavier uh, Roman equipment. It's because uh, the Romans had always had those kind of weapons. It's just they didn't use them for the tactical purposes that, you know, a Gladius could do better. And the same Gladius, as we've seen, had actually evolved from the same kind of Latin straight war. It, it, it was the same thing, right? Um, and we often, again, overlook this aspect that is as if, you know, the Romans had the, 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 the dagger and, you know, the Celts had the, the straight. Act, actually, the, the, the beginning is that they, they had actually the same thing. Roman swords of the archaic period, doesn't matter if they're curved or like the corpus uh, or, you know, the straight, they were of the same length. Of the Celtic ones, and there is no difference in that sense. They were essentially the same level of overloaded, oligarchic, aristocratic, uh, feudal mentality that, in even still in fourth century Rome, was still there. Right, the fact of well, how the Romans dramatically developed their military capacity brought, as we were saying, to to adapt certain weapons to tactics, as it's always the case, overwhelmingly, and not the other way around. But still, the Gladius did maintain some of those characteristics and wasn't you know, a small thing or uh, at all, you know, but there was a complexity to it that is often understood. But just think about the moment of maximum industrial produ production, paradoxically towards the the later empire, right? When the fabrics were fundamentally standardized and brought also under more direct control of the state, not the legionnaires actually making their own uh, largely. And so there you find still the, the cheaper stuff that is uh, produced like for again troopers there there was a further development of of combined armed tactics so uh, this is something we discussed elsewhere you you do need a, uh, it, it's positive to have lighter troops from one side and heavier troops from another right so that you can collect your training costs a lot but still making them cooperate on the field because they're dramatically advanced and that's why the Constantinian army had the greatest offensive and defensive capacity tactically speaking that that the the, the Roman army had ever seen um, but indeed, there is all an undertone, right? That that is about this warrior obsession that all peoples had had, right? The Greeks, the Romans, the Celts, the Germans were all about. They, they all stem from the same exact culture, um, and that revered um, heroic warfare ideal, Incl including mounted combat, by the way, which is not never to be underestimated either. So these wars were, as you know, mostly they had a bar center shifted towards the, the top because they could give this dramatic uh, hit from from slashing from from up up down, um, and also on horseback having kind of more more reach, uh, more kind of especially cutting capacity at that point. Um, but the um, that comparing, let's say, the, with, with the, the the serious production of Roman weapons, of course, the early medieval ones were were something else, right? They, they were, uh, you know, loaded in precious ornaments. They were weapon jewels, um, contributing to making us understand how much in the passage between antiquity and the Middle Ages, war and the warrior uh, became an activity and an aristocratic profession. Right, surrounded by a value and respect previously unknown to the West. Um, and on here, the, there should be some further considerations to make, because in fact, also, uh, these technological improvements, like, civilization was, was young, still, paradoxically, and so, uh, even in the Bronze Age, yes, there, there was some times, uh, but things w that as you know, this dramatic overloading, the dram even greater 
properly biased for heroic warfare, but of course the means weren't as sophisticated as they would become later on. Or at least they were very much for the time, but things get improving and in Europe they, they were, again here, yes it was kind of an heroic ideal, but still they were mediated with a kind of a more um, organized and almost um, rationalized idea of themselves compared to, to more primitive times. And the cost of these weapons w was expensive, that because you understand that the whole community of course paid for it in a way that was ever more properly I also ideologically supported in a, in a re replicable way. According to Arab sources, an excellent sword could be worth up to a thousand gold dinar. Right, so here there is a, a bit of equivalences to be made for early medieval times. Um, because even assuming that this assessment that, that is coeval actually with the disappearance of gold minting from the West and the Carolingian monetary reform is somewhat exaggerated, because 1000 gold dinar is really, you know, a lot, it nevertheless gives the idea by scale of the enormous value of these weapons. Right, so a gold dinar was something like 4.25 grams and thus a sword was something like 4 kilos and 250 kilograms of gold worth, right, so a fortune. Um, and since the Carolingian monometallic system prevents us from, from different comparisons, because it was a basic all in silver, at least it, it may not be illegitimate to refer to the relationship between the value of equal quantities of the two metals as it emerges from from certain calculations have been made especially from by Fournial about the Carolingian age and this ratio is something like one uh, say I'll tell you 11 point uh, 21 which we can uh, round down right so and and so this would mean in proportion that a sword, let's say an excellent sword, the best sword, will have had a value of 47 uh, kilograms of silver, 47.6425. Um, so in the 9th century the theoretical weight of Carolingian, or Carolingian silver denier fluctuated from say between a let's say 1800 and 2000 grams, right? So let's make an average of 1 gram and 9, 1.9 something gram, right? It re we result that a, a weapon roughly amounts to 99 pounds of denier silver, right? So this is still a, a lot, right? It, it's, it's, Again, it's for the top, imagine the best swords possible ever in, in early medieval Europe. This may still be exaggerated, right? But what, imp what is important here is the high scale values. It's, by, it's the fact that, again, it's like before Cassiodorus saying about the performance that these swords could cut through armor, at least in the 6th century. Well, it is exaggerated, but again, don't think it's that far from the truth. Because for saying that out loud, for, for sources to say, okay, well, yeah, they're that, that expensive, it means they were very expensive. They were a great exaggeration, but still not not, uh, not inside of, 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 a, of a real assessment. Right, there are other exaggerations of the sources in, in other terms, but still, these exaggerations tell us a substantial doubt. And also, as we were saying before, it should be noted, n noted that at the end of the 9th century, the production of pattern welders was ceased abruptly, by the way, was replaced by that of completely homogeneous steel swords. And Wieland's sword is of this type. So what did actually happen? Well, 9th century, everybody, we talked just yesterday about post carolingian times, in this case, we're still in Carolingian times, but in the moment of the collapse. What is happening in the 9th century? The private elite is taking over. Lords everywhere. The homogenization and, and dramatical development of mounted war 
of, of private culture, of military culture, right? In the next century, we have a military class that emerges, right? It's the one of the militas, which the knights would spring. So what happened here is that um, privatization and the, the overrunning of public prerogatives, uh, rights, uh, assets, etc., means more people of these local... Um, Feudatories, we can call them at this point, and massed ever more wealth individually, and could increase dramatically the quality of the swords, the the availability of properly of mounted combat and the training and all the technical development for for these weapons to to become ever more uh, effective in a world that was ever more properly militarized in in the elites that were equipped with such swords, and that fought. As a, as a regular activity, as a normal, as, as a lifetime profession, right? So, uh, this is the moment in which really cavalry in the, in the direction of the, probably the heavy medieval one that we recognize knights in began to, to affirm itself, right? The, the Carolingian world, already the, Gal uh, the, 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 the Merovingian one, the Gallo-Roman, even the Celtic had had this important uh, quasi-feudal nature, right? Which swords had uh, always belonged, in a sense, this top swords to, to an elite of, of mounted warriors with various degrees, even in there, of course, of, of, of development, historically speaking, that had nurtured this, this kind of elite uh, system that in France is so well, especially so well documented. Right, properly that would 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 emerge in this perfectly functional, um, heavily armored uh, military professional and and mounted elite from which knights would would spread. So again, even in here, swords increase dramatically in quality. So armor does because they are designed also to cope against one another. They're not just some standard objects developing in a vacuum without application. They needed that. And they went in parallel. But the cost here is even. And so faced with such enormous value of a sword, right? it, it is important, um, of course, aside from the approximation and the, the exa exaggerations, to, to realize that, let's say, that the value of these words went went so beyond, not just because again of the material cost of it. Right, there was an extra demand, let's say, an extra need for for these words to be there. Right, we, for example, we may be amazed, and this is, these are the dangers of materialist interpretation of history and just you know social economic Marxist kind of, because of course they don't take in consideration what the context, they, they say it's just material, you know, you don't have to worry about anything else, the earth doesn't exist, human mind does not exist, dreams, ambitions, power, strength, no, no, instead, this, this is the, the power of the mind. If we reason with that, with that perspective, we would never understand why such extremely expensive goods were, for example, buried. They were buried, literally, you know, you know descending under the earth, with their master to rest by his side, right? We would have done this, right? Of course, th there were sometimes ways of treasuring these weapons over the generations, but still, the beliefs, the belief system that made all the system work was, was of course, finalized still to the idea that these warriors were somewhat a chosen elite that went beyond... Uh, that reached beyond humanity itself. It was something about the, the 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 terrifying wrath and superiority and and power of the military deity of the skies, right? Uh, they it was about the empire. It was about world rule. It was about being the chosen people. The Carolingians were radically obsessed with Old Testamentary military content. 
um, they literally believed they were the new Jews, that they, 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 they were chosen by God to rule the world because they were Franks and they were superior to others. Um, the whole Merovingian and Carolingian world was soaked into in blood, quite literally meant from the battlefields, but even to the liturgy. There is an hematophilia of Frankish culture that was deeply rooted in the Germanic obsession for, for struggle of superiority, of extermination, of, of enslavement, of, of, of that it, it is what in the primitive arcane um, you know, roots of, of Indo-European culture what was what the warrior had to be it was a a, per, a, a hero a, a demigod somebody who was so superior to others that had to sublimate himself in this uh, radical and violent and bloody and and disruptive effort to to bring the world under its own authority controlling discipline because that's what made a real man what a real individual worth of sitting next to the gods once dead right so the sword embodied this this word was a sacred object. We made a video about this. The fact that uh, the pagan world, as much as the Christian world, in the same ways, blessed, consecrated the swords. The sword was a sacred object, right? It was the, the condensation of all the civilizational values that would make you know, an empire like the Carolingian one in the 9th century with the means of the time to rule essentially over a half of Europe out of fundamentally almost nothing aside from these important aristocratic base of course that had formed in the Frankish world historically but that that the sword embodied as as the top military instrument and symbol and and all the, the emotions attached to it in the sword lived the 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 same warrior think about the Durandal what does Roland complain when he dies does he care about um, his woman was was crying because she, she knows he's gonna. He doesn't give a damn. He he. All what he thinks about is his ward. That's the only thing that actually has a sim He's able to love, because the psychological background from which these people came, in order to be the ones who could hold the ward like that, was of of a radically traumatized and violently functionalized existence that saw no other. No other purpose but glory, bloodshed, and the, the self-affirmation of such faculty of command over the world. And what a better symbol than a sword. And especially such an excellent one. Swords were magic, right? Uh, magic, if you wonder what supernatural exists, supernatural does exist. Because it doesn't matter whether you can... You can demonstrate it scientifically or not what what the, the important thing is that people in history believed in it and act upon that so even if it doesn't exist it doesn't matter it, it still exists in the way it's, it's able to channel these enormous forces that today are almost incomprehensible to individuals who are just told that you know after all it's just about having this kind of very mediated kind of condensated education that the mostly abstracted from real application you know not that that drives away from any individual pressure and effort and these people lived in in in, in situations that objectively you would have not liked to to live in and in this sense it's this is the reason why civilization evolved to surpass this but it, it we don't often see it that without this there would have have not been a civilization either because the order was created in that way it was it was a non-existent one I mean, civilization was just some millennia old, right? It wasn't something uh, just like today, by the way. So um, these people had to make it out of nothing, and they had to do it with these beliefs. So um, aside from the difference in absolute and relative sense between the economic parameters of that and, and of this time, uh, the question of uh, concerns above all, but obviously, the magical and religious value of objects in general as the swords, right? The, the prestige of which uh, pushed to work uh, it like a jewel, to pay a fortune for it, to finally take it with you on the longest journey, the one from which no return is allowed. Because when you become a warrior, like this, this is beyond mortality, 
right? Th this is this is what you're doing in the face of God, of sempiternal power, right? Of absolute power, of of all-encompassing power. The moment in which you become a knight, you there is no return anymore, right? And so. For any of these expeditions, for any of these, where you are meant to go there and either win or die. And we know that reality is different because you need to be more concrete at some point. But the idea is that from the elite you could expect only this, in theory. That there was no way you could devote yourself to that lifestyle in the first place and suffering the strains and the pressure that that a campaign and the risks of of the time um without any kind of modern medicine or or, or physics uh, uh physical understanding or uh, that that you would have to take matters in your own hand and prove yourself to be as strong as 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 a war can make you just by going there and being worth of that worth of that sword again swords require dramatic training right and the sword itself, like the horse, by the way, was an arcane companion. Development of horsemanship at this point of breeds of you know that specific war wide word like when they, it, it's all one with this. You cannot understand what a sword is if you don't understand what a sword uh, what what a horse is, what the knight is, of course, what what armor is in that matter. But you cannot understand it even if you don't understand in fact these the, what these armies were, what the tactics were, what the political and social background is. In other words, you cannot abstract a sword just as an object or even something that you use individually, ab abstracted from any kind of possible historical context because nobody's ever, will never be able mathematically, but not even, you know, closely replicating what an ancient combat was like, right? It's kind of, you know, almost pitiful to see how naively such a force are made as if we, we could even you know think the the way they did right if you don't if you, if you can't even think the way they did any kind of uh, any kind of uh, simulate it's ridiculous it doesn't make any sense scientifically speaking doesn't matter how much uh, you spend your life holding wielding swords or whatever it, it has absolutely nothing to do even remotely with any form of positive understanding that we can have on those words just by itself right in order to understand these things one must overload himself herself with an astonishing amount of information that still will not even at that point make it probably satisfactory to you. and just fixating with material dimensions or individuality in in, in just in warfare was about combined arms that it has no no meaning whatsoever right uh, you cannot. Uh, it, it's difficult sometimes how to explain to to people how individuals are less important than 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 collective in, in a in, on a battlefield, because they they tend to think that 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 the outcome is the sum of the individual capacities, whereas it's really not like that. There is a superior force that lays within the collective within the unit that is superior to the sums of the individuals and if you don't get that and how to use it the individual is 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 just going to be rotting in a very few time and that kind of kind of you know reality is slapping you in the face for even thinking that such complicated systems can be positively sorted out just by fixating on the individuality uh, of it is is an asinine display of you know uh, basically n n no scientific education whatsoever of course no historical education whatsoever so be very very careful about any kind of you know positivistic uh, progressistic view of history or what you can you know derive positively but by just picking one factor and pretending that's that's all it matters in order to explain things because that's not what mathematics and physics and the real world and any kind of experience that we have actually uh, tell us, right? But not even summing that thing factor with just one, another one or two or three. Like it, it's much more, and it has to be tested on what is real, not on what you pretend it to be real. You pretend to be real. Um, and then there is no need to digress how on how the sacredness of weapons in general and how the sword in particular is common to several traditional civilizations, which 
know many taboos, by the way, r relating to weapons, to iron. Again, if one doesn't actually understand that mindset, again, cannot understand how the sword works. It's, it's a completely worthless effort. Um, now, forged by, you see, that craftsman magician who was the blacksmith, all the elements converged in, in its processing, right? You know, the earth from which the metal was drawn, the fire that served to bend it to the will of man, that was a damnation. Think about Prometheus. Think about what, what the knowledge of bloodshed in the first place was, was like a damnation. Because it, of course, reflected, again, that you could not come back. That once you had learned how to kill, you you bear a responsibility that you will never be able to wash your, you know, the, the, you, you, uh, away from yourself and that you will have to respond. And this was understood collectively as much as religiously. Um, the air that cooled the sword, the water that tempered it. In the Wieland saga, as we've seen before, birds also collaborate um, as needed, sacred animals among the Germans. And not only, as we've seen also about among the Romans, among the Celts. And not only. Um, uh, G's that um, say whose language only initiates can understand. Right, the goose above all, the sacred bird par excellence. For example, in in Fa, um, Fafnismal, as, as uh, the blood of Fafner, uh, the dragon Fafner is ingested from Sigurd by Sigurd. Well, Sigurd immediately understands the language of birds, which allows him to discover the deception of the blacksmith region. And even in that point, there is a significant association between hero, wonderfully forged sword, blacksmith, and birds. Right? And as for the sacredness of the goose and the parallel um, one of the swan, for example, which are also found in non-Indo-European mythological uh, say, uh, figures, let's say it's most likely passed to the Germans by the Celts. Probably not entirely, but still in importantly. In, in, in so, And from the Germans then to our Middle Ages, in which uh, a divergent destiny at a cultural level followed, right, remaining more or less intact at the folk level. The migration era, the G's migrate. Right? There was a deep meaning in properly the political dimension of what it meant to be able to fight while moving across the world, discovering the unknown, having to cope essentially with with the with the unavoidable, uh, and this is what in Ger in the Germanic uh, men mentality was the, the the dramatic destiny, the tragic destiny of heroes, right? The negative fate of the world. I mean, the the fact that this thing was going down. Right, and this was present also in you know, in many other. Think about the Christianity, the eschatology. Oh, naturally, all this blended in, as you understand, in the early Middle Ages. But what I would like to stress is how these values, these these details, are actually mirroring, if uh, the one of the G's, uh, you know, droppings, let's say, uh, as as a as a detail, right? But how much, you know, it reflects the in a directly proportional way, the, the meaning of an entire people, of an entire existence, of an entire culture. And that fundamentally, we are still heavily drawing from it, even whether we, we don't actually realize. Um, and of course, there was eventually a, a, de a demonization, in part, because we think that Christianity demonized in a, in a non- culture, let's say, in a non-civilizational way, and that actually was a, a deep form of education, to understand how also these models had to be integrated into something greater that had still to make sense, right? Uh, again, as we were saying before, that the, the Christianity could have simple er, simply erased this thing. It said it kind of explained them, it kind of gave them an interpretation that was um, in part... Um, of course, also obscuring the reality, but in a way, going beyond, right? You cannot have the superiority of medieval uh, 
uh, military civilization in the form of a 13th century knight if you don't surpass the ancient pagan symbols, right? It doesn't make any sense. Those were more primitive and less effective military inferior societies. There's no way around that civilization advances and hell how it advances without losing even for a, for a, for a moment its destructive capacities that are actually ever growing. Von Clausewitz explained this pretty, pretty well. So, of course, the goose, for example, is one of the animals accompanying witches to the Sabbath. On the other hand, uh, the, the same goose, in fact, is accepted, at least in terms of devotional uses within the, the Christian uh, custom, within the, within, the Christian, within the Christian culture. The goose marching towards the Holy Land to show pilgrims the way is a legend of the first crusade widespread in the Rhenish area. Do you think it's a, it's a coincidence? Of course not. Of course the crusades are in a, in a distant way, of course the outcome of a migration era. And again, the migration era wasn't born in the migration era. All Indo-European peoples were nomadic. They migrated. All their culture was uh, fabricated in, in, in that in that moment, it was defined. It was the the way of the the the, the world was 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 based on that vision. The journey, the spiritual trap. This, this is something. Why do you think it, it remained in, within Christianity? It's because you have to fuel that, mostly from a mental point of view. Because otherwise, you cannot make it even physically. And then, of course, the need to all be all in arms like an ancient tribe were, were over. But we saved that that wisdom and of course Christianity channeled it dramatically um, also in 15th century Pistoia uh, the, the word goose processions used in honor of the uh, August Madonna uh, the, the language of birds uh, as a sacred one is of course inherited all over Europe in, in its deeper cultural identities. Now, so, the point is this, the sword itself is sacred. And it is sacred properly in itself. It is confirmed by both epic and juridical, by the way, German pagan sources. Sources which are also largely, uh, you know, as epic, juridic, legal, religious, the, the same. Because that's how the world was without the, the separations of powers, and how more primitive and of a synthesis and uh, re it really was, because everybody was kind of called to do the same thing. The last time was uh, less articulated, less developed um, systems, and they up to that point they had been working fine that way. But they were all condensated, and everybody would have understood those meanings. All right. But for now, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.